Hi, it's Jack from the MMA Island Podcast. Before this video gets started, before you listen to the podcast, big shout out to our sponsors, BetUS. If you are going to place a bet on MMA, basically any sport, do it through them. Their, their program is so great. They have everything that you would need to make a bet, to, to look at the bet, the props, everything there. If you want to do a parlay, it's there. Please go through BetUS. The link is in our description, in our bio. It'll be on Instagram. You can find it everywhere. BetUS, big shout out to our sponsor. I'm Jack Kennedy, and they hit a lot harder in my opinion too. What is up everybody, my name is Caelan McNamara, and everyone's got a plan until they get hit with my views. I am Hunter Boss, he just wanted to go to the distance by the looks of it, but he couldn't even do that. And this is the MMA Island Podcast. Thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MMA Island Podcast. I am Jack Kennedy alongside Keila McNamara, and welcoming, welcoming on again the podcast is Tanisha, a great friend of the podcast. Welcome on again. He is the host of the Haymaker MMA Show and works for PFL doing stuff down there in Florida. How's it going? It's going well, man. Yeah, I'm doing a little temporary three-week job again with the PFL. I'll fight a concierge, work with a bunch of fighters. It's Honestly, when I t- sit back and look at it, it's pretty fucking awesome got really lucky with it also worked a little bit and um yeah i appreciate you guys having me on absolutely well let's go ahead let's go ahead and get into it today all the all the breakdown what we're going to be talking about no ufc this weekend but we had some great cards elsewhere and other promotions bellator 264 uh gagar musasi versus john salter pfl rory mcdonald lost to ray cooper in a shocking fight um dan hooker just got a fight booked and will we see John Jones at heavyweight will be how we'll end this podcast off. Let's go ahead and get into it tonight. What did you make of the Bellator main event between Gegard Mousasi and John Salter? So Gegard Mousasi, I have his page up right now, and I was thinking about 40 so wins. So he has 48 wins in his career yep. and just seven losses. That's yep. a one to, that's a seven to one win loss ratio, which is absolutely insane. Yep. The dude's been a champion every organization he's been at besides the UFC and he showed why he's been that kind of champion the guy put on the pressure i mean he got taken down in the first round and a little bit in the second but once he was on top and started raining down those bombs like salter was uh yeah john was pretty pretty lost and he pretty much succumbed to the pressure put by gaygard as always classy performance and that yep. dude is the fucking man yeah, dude, what a performance this was from Gegard Musasi. Um, you know, we've all, all three of us really have waxed lyrical about Musasi for years now, certainly as long as we've been on the podcast. And yeah. once again, he justified that amazing tag that he has. You know, a while ago, not to plug myself, because that's certainly not what I'm doing, but a while ago, I had an amazing opportunity to talk to Renier de Ryder, one championships middleweight and light yeah. heavyweight champion. And the, one of the first names that came out of his mouth in terms of who he trains with was Gegard Musasi. And for very, very good reason. Musasi's an amazing mixed martial artist, be under no illusion. And in many ways, now that he's almost free from the constraints of the UFC, he has really shown his class in spades. Two time middleweight champion at Bellator. And that's not even getting into his performance this past weekend against John Salter. You know, Salter managed to get a very good takedown early in the first round. This would have demoralized quite a lot of fighters, but it didn't demoralize Gegard Musasi. Came back with some vicious body knees, almost like that amazing Muay Thai work in the clinch. Got the knees, really hurt Salter. Leapt onto the advantage and pushed it home in the second and third round. And like tonight perfectly said, those bombs rained down on the ground against Salter and the fight is over. Gegard Musasi is one of the best mixed martial artists on this planet, and he rubber stamped that uh, tag even further this past weekend. Unbelievable win! Oh yeah, hey, absolutely. When you talk about guys that one of the, some of the most underrated fighters, I would put Gegard Musasi almost at the top of that list tonight. I'm so glad you brought up his record because how absolutely insane is that? I was lucky enough to be there all throughout the fight week and and, and in the in the building and. It was actually a really big sense that John Salter was going to get the win. Most of the main people over there were thinking John Salter or, or feeling John Salter, especially come fight night. Um, and that's that's for good reason. John Salter is a legit fighter. He's so explosive. And it showed that in the first round. 
Now, I was always sticking on the opinion that Gegard has been there. I mean, look at his record. He was 47-7-1 and one coming into um, the, the fight with John Salter. He's seen that. His cardio is there. And when he's on the feet, he is so technically great that it's so hard to pick him apart. Whenever John Salter uh, won the first round, he's so explosive and everything, but he, he will he, he tends to drain in his fights, and that's exactly what ended up playing out. Uh, he won the first round, but then Gegard Mousasu came back in the second round, defended the majority of the takedowns, and started to get control on the feet. And actually, at the end of the second round, the fight really could have been stopped. It was a similar sequence to where the fight did get stopped in the, in the third the third round comes, Gegard's in full control. He's in his element. He's used to fighting five rounds. He's calm. It's just at his age with the amount of fights that he's had, he continues to stop, keep beating these top contenders, these explosive guys. It's so great to see. And it's just greatness. I mean, in the arena, it blew up whenever he won. Um, it's just it's just so great to see Gegard Mousasi get a win. And this is a guy, regardless of promotion, that I – and I know we all do, but I hope people continue to talk about because he deserves all of the recognition he gets because he is a top level mixed martial artist, mixed, mixed martial artist, even today at his age. He's still the champ. He's still defending. And now he's finishing fights. That's one of the things whenever we interviewed him this week, he was like, I'm going for the finish. And he did it. He got to finish over a young guy in John Salter. Um, and it was just great to see. Yeah, that was awesome. And I was just thinking back to, you know, the videos that people make, the top 10 UFC fighters who haven't won a belt. Yeah. And I would always think Dan Henderson was number one. But I think Gegard Mousasi right now has taken that mantle up. The greatest fighter yeah. to never win a UFC belt. But, yeah, just look at the work he's done, especially in that last fight. It just made it so clear that he was the man. Even when he was in the UFC, he beat Weidman, Uriah Hall, Thiago Santos, you name it. And... He didn't get his opportunity. He paid his dues, but he didn't get the opportunity. Yep. And now he's been getting his opportunity in Bellator. And he beat Lima. He beat Salter now. And it's absolutely awesome. So happy for the guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say a lot more than what tonight's just said. Gegard Musasi is one of those guys who you just cannot hate. You have, you have no reason to dislike him. And you certainly couldn't if somehow you tried to. I actually really like two points that both you guys have made, and they form the basis of an amazing evaluation of Gegard. The first point is Tanai's initial point about his record. Think about what Tanai's just said there. Seven to one ratio against the best 185 fighters on the planet. That's a record that is matched by very, very few, if any, fighters in the world. It's an amazing elite resume, and they're not, I mean, they are against the best that are out there. Gegard Musasi really is one of the most underrated fighters in the world, possibly ever. I really do think that is the case. The second point that I'm going to make to finish off Gegard's evaluation is actually the stamina point, but I'm going to flip it. John Salter does fade in his fights the longer they go on. That is very true. But the work Gegard's put into his own stamina is paying off in abundance, and it's so, so impressive. Gegard's stamina has never been bad, necessarily. It's just so much better now than it was before. You know, his stamina was always good, but now it's elite. And now he really can push the pace. And like he said to Jack and Chris in MMA Island's media before the fight, now he can go and push forward for the finishes because he knows he can just push that pace relentlessly. He can push his opponent around the octagon. He can bully him. And that's exactly what he did against John Salter. Like a true veteran, he weathered the storm of the takedowns, got the control in the feet, and then started to bully him and push him around. And that's the sign of a true champion for me. Speaking of, sorry to interrupt, but speaking of um, yeah. Jack and Chris being at the event, how was he on the mic? Because I always think that he is very marketable, and I don't know why the UFC didn't do that. And you guys were in person, so how was it just him responding to you? So that is, so. I'm so glad you brought that up, because that is something Chris and I were talking about all week going into it. Um, it was just, we were, you, you can watch on YouTube comp compilations of him just talking and being hilarious and everything. We were there and with him. One, he's such a genuine guy, but whenever you open up the camera, once you open up the mic and start talking to him, he's so genuinely funny that it's it's hilarious. He's definitely marketable. And one, the UFC didn't do that right. They did not market him right. Um, but two, 
Bellator should really take advantage of the opportunity that they have now with the Gegard Mousasi versus Austin Vanderford fight that they set up at the end of it. Because with that fight right there, if they market Gegard the right way, if they actually promote him the right way, and you have Paige Van Zandt's husband, right? That could be a big fight for Bellator. And the way that they will both be talking trash to each other, it's going to be hilarious. And, and that is absolutely something. I'm so glad you brought that up because the way Gegard, his personality is, he's such a, he's such a, you can't not like him, but he's also so funny. Um, that it's, it's, it's also easier to get behind him. So yeah, that's a great point. It, it, just, just like you see on, on YouTube and everything, that's exactly how he is in person. Yeah, next time you get a chance to talk to Coker or something, like you said you did, tell him to market Gegar a lot yeah. more. Because I thought after he beat Lima, because Lima was almost the face of the yep. organization, Lima and Pitbull, yeah. I thought they would blow him up a little bit more, but they didn't do as well as they should have. No, they, it was more like you only got the feeling at, in fight week, like right before mm-hmm. the fight and everything. And even then, I mean, you want to have it as equal as you can for promotion-wise, but when you have a guy like Gegar Musasi who's fighting someone like John Salter, who is a name but nowhere near where Gegard mm-hmm. Musasi is, they need to take advantage of that. So I completely agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. They have yeah, to market him as the best uh, or the most successful middleweight of all time or yeah. something like that. Just put Or the best fighter in their him. promotion, yeah. which they could do. Yep. Put that tag on him. Yep. Yeah, but he's definitely the best 185er they have. Why not mm-hmm. push that? I fully agree with you guys. Like you said, Musasi has something that you cannot train and you cannot instill... You can't instill it into a guy like Chael Sonnen at his peak. You can't instill it to any fighter. You cannot give someone natural charisma. And Gegard Musasi has got that in bucket loads. Use that to build your company further. And especially, and I, I think this is an amazing point to mind, it's something I was kind of thinking along the same lines of too. A fight with Austin Vanderford is perfect because you've got two guys with this built-in inherent charisma who can go back and forth with each other without it being forced, without it being pushed. It's perfect for marketing. And even though Austin Vanderford is known on social media as Paige Van Zandt's husband, he's a good fighter in his own right. These guys will write and sell the script on their own if they're nurtured properly. Of that, I have no doubt. That was Jack's point, by the way, the Austin point. So, Sorry, uh, Jack. Hey, it's good. <laughs> hey, we all share it. We all share it. It's all good. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on now, PFL, and, and, and tonight you were over there for that. Rory McDonald, Ray Cooper, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so, I mean, not to gas the company that I'm working from up too much, but we got some fucking talent. <laughs> like, you look at yeah. not just Rory but you look at Pettis you see what happened to these guys and a few other UFC guys that came on or some or Bellator guys it's been tough for them it's not easy just because you're not in the UFC that you're just going to walk over all these guys like the PFL signed these big names expected to push them and to win but it it paid off in a different way than they thought it would it, they thought it, they would they would carry their divisions be the champion and rule over them but it paid off in a way that showed that PFL has their own set of class, classy fighters. So Ray Cooper is one of those guys. He was a champ in 2019, the PFL's last season, and a finalist who lost to Magomed Magomed Karimov in 2018. So Ray Cooper is a top dog, man. He's he's finished almost every single one of his fights, and he put on a show on a veteran and a world-class fighter in Rory McDonald, dominated on the feet, and then when he took him down, which was most of the fight, he kept him there and beat him up a little bit yeah um amazing point about ray cooper nothing i can disagree with whatsoever you know that this really has been an unintended side consequence of the the sort of exodus from the ufc of these former vets guys like eddie alvarez demetrius johnson you know um rory mcdonald and so on and so forth realistically one of the only successful guys who's left the ufc and become better has really been gegar masasi yeah, right? i mean the the talent that's been nurtured with guys like ray cooper and so on and so forth really is a very impressive thing and i actually don't think tonight's wrong to market the pfl because they have got some serious talent amongst their mm. ranks they genuinely do you know for years the pfl has been seen as sort of the minor leagues that feed the major leagues but the PFL is really on the up here. They're almost becoming the third tier alongside Bellator and the UFC, I feel personally. Yeah. 
as for the fight itself, you know, I thought Rory McDonald was going to go out and knock Ray Cooper out. That was personally my opinion. That's how I saw it happening. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> you know, Ray Cooper, when I absolute masterclass, controlled the pace, controlled the distance, you know, beating Rory up in the feet, which who does that? Nobody ever beats up Rory McDonald on the feet. And Ray Cooper did. When the fight hit the deck, I thought Lawler, or sorry, not Lawler, McDonald would be able to at least escape and get back to the feet. Ray Cooper kept him there as long as he wanted to. Again, no easy feat against an elite level fighter like Rory McDonald. You know, Ray Cooper, I talk a lot in the podcast about prime real estate of fighting taking your opportunity when the bright lights are on. And Ray Cooper did that and then some huge things are in his future because that was an amazing win. Massive congrats to Ray Cooper. And that's a massive scalp for him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. To start off my thing, I'm going to give massive shout out to the PFL for what they're doing, just like as well Bellator, because they really carried the torch this weekend without UFC and they put on some phenomenal shows. Um. The PFL is so good because it's different. The way it's set up is different. It's not like other organizations. It follows a different format, and that's what makes it entertaining. I mean, you have the ref cam and everything like that. But like Tanai said, you have legit talent there. And like Keelan said as well, you have legit talent there, and it's 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 growing. It's fantastic. Um, Rory McDonald, I think, did not look his best that night. And I think he's not – I think really – and this is way back, but really, ever since that Robbie Lawler fight, it has not, he's not been able to match what he once was. Um, Ray Cooper, lights are on him, just like Elon said, just like tonight said, and he put on a phenomenal show. He looked so great. And I mean, he's got to be a favorite to win the whole thing. He, he, he looked so great. Um, I really like Ray Cooper and, and, and tonight broke down how great he's been doing in the, in the PFL and, and, and the organization for as long as he's been in there. He has the potential to become the company man. And uh, now he doesn't, he's not as marketable as Gegard Mousasi. Like he, he doesn't have as, as big a personality. He doesn't talk that much, but the way he is consistently at the top can, uh, most of the time, that is something that the, the PFL could absolutely market, especially after a win over Rory McDonald. Um, yeah, I, I just – you have to give your, your hat off to him. I'm not going to add too much onto what you guys said because you broke it down perfectly. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's just – it's so fun to see something like that happen. And the last thing I want to end, end it off on is kind of on Rory McDonald. I think this might be the last we see of him um, in MMA. Um, mm-hmm. I, 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 I really do. After losing this, I mean – I think he mentally, I think he was in it, especially after losing the fight before that, which we all agree he won. I mean, I, I don't know a single person who thinks he did not win that fight. Um, but a- after this, I just, I just don't know if his heart's fully in it. And I think that at, I think after this fight, he might realize that maybe he does one more season, but I think if this not it, if this isn't it one more season, and then that'll be it for, for Roy McDonald's my, my kind of take on it. Yeah, I, I'd agree. Roy didn't look his best. He was too predictable with the single yeah. legs, especially early yeah, on. Right. And Ray's just too powerful and smart to avoid those and For get sure. a better position. So I don't know if you guys watch Marvel or the Avengers or anything like that. In the very first Avengers, we when we see Thor, he gets a headbutt from Iron Man. And Ray Cooper reminds me of that Thor, that if you punch him, he's just going to stay there and he's going to hit you back much harder. Yeah. That is what Ray Cooper represents. Very marketable guy. I wish I love Ray. Got a chance to work with him. I wish he would like he has a great charisma that he doesn't give a fuck. And he, all he's here to do is fight and knock you out. But if he could just portray that a little bit more on the mic, he could be a very useful asset sure. to any company he's at. And right now the PFL should back him. I'll also bring up because we're talking about 170s at PFL Magomed Magomed Karimov from Dagestan, had a dominant performance. He actually beat Ray Cooper in the 2018 finals, and he submitted him via guillotine. And we, um, the PFL cut a promo with Habib and Masvidal praising him because he trains at ATT. Masvidal yeah. was talking about him. And obviously, Habib's the main name from Dagestan. So he was talking about him. Habib said that I'd love to see uh, Magomed versus uh, Roy McDonald. So he gets that extra push. But luckily for Ray Cooper, he stepped up and took that push from Roy McDonald's name. So good on both those guys. I can't wait for the finals in October. 
Yeah, um, Ray Cooper's going to be a problem for anybody who's in his path. Be under no illusion whatsoever about that. I think the Thor comparison is very apt, actually, because it is certainly what one is reminded of when they see Ray Cooper. Yeah, I'm a big fan, just sort of on a general point before I go on to my last bit, I'm a big fan of how the PFL operates. I have to admit, whenever I first saw it about a year or two ago, I was a bit skeptical of the season sort of strategy and rankings and so on and so forth, how they rank them. But it works. It really is engaging. It's almost like fo- like European football, which we're all a big fan of. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the best do play the best or the best do fight the best. And you see those rankings change constantly and you see people advancing based on that. So Ray Cooper's a real, real talent. And what the PFL did so perfectly was they've taken a guy like Rory McDonald, who's still a huge name because of the Robbie Lawler fights, and they've put him in against a guy who the casual would think, oh, who's this guy, Ray Cooper the third? Never heard of him. And what they're doing is they're tuning in because of the guys like Lawler and their you or McDonald, sorry, and the same guys like McDonald facing these unknown guys and then they're drawn into the new talent that PFL's breeding. It's an incredibly smart strategy, one that I think they deserve a lot of credit for. Guys like Magomed and guys like Ray Cooper are on the up and they really could be dominating the ranks of the UFC within the next couple of years. I really think we could see that. As a sort of aside from McDonald himself, I well, first and foremost, I definitely agree with both of you that he didn't look his best. Uh, the reasons for that, I don't know, but he definitely was too predictable, definitely didn't flow as well as he normally would. I think perhaps his last controversial decision loss is still affecting him. That's something that I would perhaps put forward, but it's almost as if the first single leg he went for and it was blocked, he sort of checked out and he was like, right, that's it. I don't think I have a hope of winning this. To me, it was almost akin to Aljamain Sterling against Piotr Jan, but not to the same degree. It was almost as if he went for his one move, saw that it, it could be anticipated, and then he almost lost heart halfway through the fight. So I really, really don't hope this, I really hope this isn't the end of Rory McDonald because I still think he has a lot to give. But if he's going to be that predictable, then he really, really has got to switch it up and quick. Yeah, hey, completely agree. Great breakdown, guys. So I'll yeah. make one more point, yeah, yeah, if you sure. don't mind. The yeah. European soccer thing, I feel like that comparison because first off, the point system, three points for a yep. win. Yep. Also, as early as you finish the fights, you get incentives. It's almost like a goal difference that yeah. you're placing yourself high in the bracket. So that was an awesome comparison, and that absolutely makes sense. Oh, it's very you. different from any MMA organization. Yeah, hey, absolutely. And it's for everything at the end, the million dollars at the end, the, the grand prize. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, absolutely. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the news. Dan Hooker has a fight booked finally against Nasrat Hakparas tonight. What do we think about this? Yeah, so I saw in the news, um, Hooker was saying, what's the date of the fight exactly? Is it in December or something? Uh, I or- don't know. Here, I'll, I'll look it up and then I'll get back to you. Yeah, so he basically said to the UFC, give me anyone on that particular date that he's fighting at. Yeah, I'm sorry. But I, I can't remember either. The exact- UFC's September 25th. Yeah. D- September 25th? Uh, it's That's the Volkanovski-Ortega card with uh, okay. Nick, Nick Diaz on it. So yeah. on UFC 264, he said, I just want to fight on this card. You give yeah. me anyone, right? And Dan Hooker just fought. Dustin Poirier, arguably the best lightweight in the world, and Michael Chandler just fought for the belt. Dustin Poirier is really close, and Chandler finished him quick. Uh, but he's still a top guy. He's a top dog. Yeah. And I respect the shit out of him for taking this fight against an unranked opponent who's not as well-known to a lot of masses as maybe he should be because he's got some real wins as well. Yep. Hooker, obviously super dangerous with those knees and elbows and just making the fight dirty and go his way. He's also really tall for that 155 um, division. He knows how to use it very well. Um, Nasrath Hasrath, on the on the other hand, I hope I said his name pretty well. It's close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Besides recently, Drew, Drew Dober, he's done really well. He's a solid kickboxer, and I think it's going to be a great fight. They'll just stand and bang, to be honest. Nothing more Dan Hooker loves to do than just get it nice and fun for the fights and yep. bloody, you know? 
Yeah, um, I, I really have to echo tonight's sentiment there. Massive respect to the guy, Dan Hooker, for taking this. Anybody who says, just put me on the card, I don't care who I'm up against, you know wants to be there and you know is going to show up. So massive props to Dan Hooker from the offset for that. I actually think this is the makings for a real firefight. Um, I think it's going to be great. Nasrat Hakparast is a very good kickboxer. He's unranked, as we know, but he's 13-3, and three, has some really good wins. The most well-known, I would say, is probably Mark Diakise, who was a very tough fighter back during his sort of peak whenever he was on his own run. So I think this will be a very, very good fight. I think it's an amazing addition to UFC 266. And I can almost see this going similarly to the Edson Barbosa fight with Dan Hooker. The big, big, big issue I have with Dan Hooker, pretty much the only issue I have, but by far the biggest, is his defense. He does not block anything. You could throw a cartwheel kick at him and he's going to eat it just for the sake of eating it. <laughs> and the problem is that's all well and good if you're fighting a wrestler or a jiu-jitsu fighter. But if you're fighting a legit kickboxer, your defense has got to be top-notch or you're going to get eaten alive. And Nasrat Hakparast Hak is unranked, admittedly, but he still has the skills. Kickboxing skills are kickboxing skills. And whenever he opened up his body to someone like Edson Barbosa, we all know the result of what happened in that fight. Vicious, constant targeting to the body that realistically would have shut down any other human being's organs, most likely. I'm not saying Hakparast hits like Barbosa or kicks like Barbosa, but a kickboxer slash Muay Thai fighter like Barbosa has laid the groundwork for how to fight a fighter like Dan Hooker. And in many ways, his massive height advantage is almost a disadvantage of 155 because he's got so much area that you can target, especially for a shorter fighter. It's very hard to fight back if they're just fighting the body, fighting the body. So I think it's an amazing fight, but from a tactical perspective, Dan Hooker has to be really, really careful here that he doesn't leave that body open. Because if he does, Hot Prost will target it and target it a lot. Yeah, what a breakdown. I mean, I think that's that's exactly accurate. The body shots are the the real weakness of, of Dan Hooker that we've seen. And I think the reason he got caught so bad against Michael Chandler was because he was so afraid of the wrestling. I mean, he was circling back the entire fight, dropped his guard one time to defend the takedown and got caught. Um, but he can take punishment, but there's a certain point in every fighter's career where you take so much punishment that you do need to do that. And he absolutely does need to work on his defense. Um, he's at the camp to where he can do that, though. I mean, he's training out of one of the best camps in the world. Um, so absolutely. This is such an interesting fight. And I'm so glad it's on 266 because what a stack car. I mean, 266, 267, 268 are so stacked. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, so Nasrat Hakparast. Many Kelvin Gastelum, as many would know him, um, is is a phenomenal fighter. Um, we all know him, but this is the big step up for him against Dan Hooker. As for Dan Hooker, this is a risk, but it's almost a necessary one if I'm in his position. I love what he's saying. I love where his mindset's at anyone, any place, any time, because he is mentally and physically getting ready to go because he needs to he needs a win in, in, in this next fight. After coming off of two losses, granted, they're off of two of the best lightweights in the planet, but it is two losses in a row. And the one before that was a controversial win over Oliver Paul Felder. Um, so it's, it's, it's a big fight for him. He fell so far in the rankings. He's ranked eighth. Now he was ranked like sixth or seven. Um, and, and that's a big drop. So let's see what happens. I really, I'm looking forward to see what Dan Hooker is going to do. If he is not hesitant, I think he could do so well in this fight and get his confidence up. One of the biggest things I think about this fight that's big is he, where his confidence confidence is out. Is he going to be hesitant out there, or is he going to be out there throwing on all cylinders, ready to go, um, and, and which he might be. It looks like he has the right mindset, but can he take a punt from Nasrat Masra, Hakparast, and will he be able to implement his pace for the fight and not go to Nasrat's pace? I think those are the biggest factors, but I don't really know about a prediction for this fight yet. Um, I, I, I kind of got to get a feeling for it. But as of right now, I am leaning a little bit towards Dan Hooker because I think his mind is in the right place. And I think he knows he needs to go out there and make a statement. 
Yeah, I agree with the prediction. Pretty similar that I think his mind is in the right place. He's fought the tougher guys, more experienced and all that. Um, I like the point Keelan made about the defense. Yeah, he just likes yeah. to stand and bang out there. Doesn't really block shots, and some it costs him sometimes, and sometimes he prevails because he can out-toughen you all day of the week. Um, I also like that he set that date. He said, yeah, I'm going to fight on UFC 260. What was it again? Six. Six. 266 yeah. on two title fights plus the return of Nick Diaz. That's such a good thing for him because he always knows how to get eyes on him. So last fight he took against a dangerous Michael Chandler. No, everyone said no to Chandler besides Hooker. It was on a McGregor right. card. A lot of eyes on him. Yeah. This is a two title return of Nick Diaz and Robbie Lawler card. All eyes on him again. And he has a really good chance to win this one. Yep. Before that, he was Dustin Poirier main event. So he knows how to get eyes on him, and he's doing it well. I think if he can get this one, he's back in the mix. Not the yeah. title mix, obviously, but just under. Well, no, but he's on a winning before. streak again. Yeah. yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with everything both you guys have just said. I'm not going to add anything on to that because I think you both just summed that up really, really well. The last point I'm going to make is actually about Nasrat Hakprost and how much credit he deserves for being willing to jump this yeah. far. In fact, this is something Sean O'Malley should have been doing a year ago. Going from non-rank to fighting the number eight lightweight on the planet, that's huge. You know, most guys will be fighting number 15 or number 14. Hack Cross is jumping up to number eight. Talk about testing yourself. Massive credit to Hack Cross as well, because he's not going to get enough credit for what he's doing. You know, he might be on a losing streak, but if you're anywhere within the top 10 of any division... You are one of the elite of the elite fighters in the world at that weight. So for Hart Paras to be willing to take his chance and step up against someone like Dan Hooker says a lot about Hart Paras himself. Huge credit to him. And I think we're going to see an amazing fight for sure. I love that you said that because he absolutely does need a lot of credit. But for if I'm in his position, this is a golden opportunity because realistically, you don't have too much pressure on you because not many are expecting you to win. But if you do win, then you're ranked almost top 10. Like realistically, you probably would be ranked in the top 10 or close to that with a win over Dan Hooker. So it's such a great opportunity. If he gets a win, he's going to shoot up for sure. Um, and it's, it's a great fight for him as well. I mean, it, it's it's a great fight to choose because it's not – Dan Hooker's also on on two fight uh, two fight losing streak. So if Nasra starts fast, maybe he can get capitalize on that. But yeah. I absolutely love it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, if he wins, he takes Hooker's spot, right? Exactly. I think all the rankings, for the most part, in the UFC make sense, besides the pound for pound make no sense to me. Oh, they never have. They never right? have, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> McGreg- McGregor's always in them, even though he no. hasn't fought in three And years Jones sometimes. is still at one, and he hasn't fought forever yeah. and everything. Uh, Adesanya is over Jan Blahovic. We literally saw that fight. <laughs> like, what is that? Yeah. But yeah. besides that, the general rankings, according to weights, are good, I think. Yeah. I, I, actually very, I just no. very, very, very slightly disagree with what Tanai said there, and it's for this reason only. I think if Hawk Paras manages to beat Hooker, I think he pushes Connor out of the top 10, not Dan. Because I, I basically said he takes a spot. So however, so if he goes to eight and Hooker goes to nine, maybe Connor moves not 10 or 11, whatever it is. So just yeah, to clear that enough, up. They absolutely. wouldn't do yeah. that, though. They wouldn't do that because they, they, they have I don't to have think Connor they would top either. 10. So they would bump they would bump <laughs> Hooker done, yeah, even yeah. though that's not right. They would. They have to have Connor top 10. Yeah. He's going to be 45 years old, and he'll still be the number eight. Like, <laughs> he hasn't fought for 10 years. He's, like, ranked three. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. But, yeah, okay, so – Now moving on to our last little segment of the day, and this is a fascinating one and one that I really want to hear your opinions on. Will John Jones ever go to heavyweight? He's denied two fights now, or it hasn't worked out for two fights now. Sanai, what do you think? I mean, he's put in the work. He gave up his belt, so I thought it was very real when he was going to go up. Now it seems a little unlikely because they made the interim belt between Cyril Gaon and Derek Lewis, so Gaon's obviously the next one. In line, I, I kind of am on John Jones's side because he's the most dominant champion, one of the most, if not the most, of all time. And why should he have to fight a Stephen Miocic or Derek Lewis or Cyril Gaon to get to Ngannou? Every other fighter who's a champion, you look at Connor, obviously. Max Holloway, when he was a 145 champ, fought Dustin directly for the interim belt. He also had a shot against Khabib, but he unfortunately couldn't make the weight. 
Uh, you look at GSP retired as a champion, came back at 185. No, no ranking fights, no number one contender fights. So why should John Jones? Is he, Adesanya, no fights at yeah. 205, went up and fought. So why should John Jones, arguably the greatest of all time, have to wait for his turn and take a chance against a Derek Lewis or a Stipe or anything that could cost him that title shot? I don't think he should. But um, I would love to see that fight with Stipe. Uh, Dana said on one of the podcasts he went on that he offered the fight to both of them, and Stipe said yes. John said no. I would love to see that fight just because I think Stipe is still the greatest heavyweight of all time, and John Jones... Like I've said before, greatest fighter of all time. So that would be an awesome fight in itself, but I do get where John's coming from. And to answer your question, I think next year we see it. You guys, for the know, you guys know how much I love John Jones in terms of pure skill and in terms yep. of pure ability. But let's be under no assumption for once he should actually have to earn his shot here because with a lot of his light heavyweight reigns against DC, whenever he's been stripped against Gustafson, he's been thrown straight into the mix when he's left in disgrace. I mean, if we're going to call this, I will call it fairly and I'll call it honestly. I think if John Jones wants to move up to heavyweight, he should have to face the greatest heavyweight there's ever been in Stipe Miocic. I think this notion that just because he was the champion in light heavyweight, he should get straight to Ngannou is... I, I just don't agree with it. I'm not going to say it's preposterous, but I, I'm not a fan of it, if I'm honest with you. You know, every guy has had to earn their shot. Daniel Cormier earned a shot. Cyril Gann has worked his way up through the division. Why should John Jones just be allowed to leapfrog all the hard work that these guys have put in recently? I mean, John Jones' last, John Jones' last two fights, he could have lost. Let's remember that as well. Yep. He, he could have, and especially in Reyes's case, very arguably should have lost those decisions. And yet, let's let's call this what it is. He's been given controversial decisions because he's John Jones. I think for once, instead of being molly cuddled by Dana, he should have to earn it. I really do think that. And especially at heavyweight, you are swimming with the Sharks because it is a very different division to light heavyweight. You know, it's not necessarily like moving up from 145 to 155 or 135 to 145. The weight gap between light heavyweight and heavyweight is huge. And plus, even from a marketing perspective, say we give John Jones and Ghani straight away and he gets flatlined. What do you do with John then? You can't send him back down to light heavyweight because his reputation's tarnished. And you can't really do anything with him at heavyweight either because he's been thrown in too soon. I don't see any angle from which John Jones getting in Ghana straight away makes sense. That's just my opinion. So, okay, this is interesting. I, this is an interesting topic right here because I, I for me, I'm kind of in between you guys. I think it makes sense under the circumstance, but I think that circumstance is now gone. Whenever they first talked about it, whenever he first relinquished the belt, whenever it first happened, and Ganu beat Stipe, Make the fight and Ganyu Jones. I think right there is when it should have happened, and I think that makes sense. Now, after the whole money situation, everything that's going on, it not working out, I think that now with the intro belt being made, one, it just can't happen at the moment because of what they've done. But two, you have Stipe, who's just in this awkward position right now, match them up, and then the winner fights that. And that creates even more hype for the Nganu fight if John Jones beats Stipe. And if Stipe beats John Jones, it's not the end of the world because one, that fight's going to do wonders as far as numbers but Stipe, between Stipe and John Jones because I would love to see it. Two of the highest fight IQs in the UFC's history going at it. Um, but if Stipe does beat John Jones, then you set up the trilogy with Nganu after Stipe beating, arguably, some people make the argument that John is the greatest fighter of all time. So that's a huge fight to make as well. I think under this circumstance right now, that's the fight that I would love to see is, is John Jones versus Stipe. Um, but if Nganu beats Cyril Gan or whoever wins that fight, Jones versus uh, the winner of Gan versus Nganu, I think makes sense if it goes that long until that, that fight uh, makes sense. But right now at this current moment when we're talking about, I think the circumstance lines up that he should be fighting Stipe. Now, that's not even the original topic here. The topic is, will he ever fight at heavyweight? I think if John Jones wants to fight again, which I think he does, He it has to be at heavyweight. With how much this has been built up, with everything that's been talked about it, 
it has to be at heavyweight. If it's not at heavyweight, I will be so disappointed. But he's putting on the weight. Everything he's doing, it's going to be such a pain if he just decides to cut back down because he's already physically and mentally preparing to be up there. It's taking a long time, and it seems like it will never happen. But in the UFC, one second news is something like it's never going to happen. The next second, it's booked. I think that's kind of the situation we're facing here. And I think we're all kind of in agreement. I do think John Jones will be fighting against two. I have no clue, but I think he will be fighting at heavyweight um, tonight. I like your timetable, but I, I think a little bit shorter than that. I'd say six to nine months. Uh, <laughs> we'll get an announcement um, that John Jones will be fighting. will be booked. Now, if that fight actually ends up happening, if he doesn't test positive for drugs, if he doesn't hit a pregnant lady, we'll see. But I hope, I hope that that fight gets booked. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you brought up the money part and then the timeline that if they would have booked it right after the Stipe Francis fight, that would have made more sense. I completely agree with that, but John wasn't willing to take his regular salary, which right. I also understand. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say, I'll bring up Stipe Miocic because we were talking about the title. We all think John's going to compete at heavyweight, right? Yeah. But Stipe, like, dude's the most successful heavyweight. How are you? He should have gotten a trilogy fight with Nganu. Right away, Great. like same, same with like DC. Give, give they him six have done months. DC. Yeah, give yeah. him six months. Yeah, and then get him the trilogy fight. They've won one each. Super dominant. One Stipe was dominant all five rounds of the first, and Ganu knocked him out in a couple of rounds in the second. Make the trilogy fight six to nine months. Let Stipe recover from those bombs, and let him have it, dude. He's the greatest fu- heavyweight ever in the UFC, and that's why I don't know if you, you guys definitely saw those comments he made on the one championship. Instagram posts or whatever he said, we might look at one championship. I understand where he's coming from because yeah. DC got two shots at at Stipe and it, it's just not fair, I think. Yeah. And also, we forgot we keep saying Jones versus Nganu, but Cyril Gan could might as well win that fucking Good. fight against Good. Nganu. I tell you what, if we're talking in terms of immediate relevancy. I think there's a very interesting mini tournament that could be had here. What if we put the interim title up for grabs, Cyril Gunn against John Jones? See if John truly is up at the heavyweight level. If he beats Gunn, then absolutely give him Nganu. Because let's not forget, I said this last week in the podcast, and I fully stand behind it now more than ever. I think Cyril Gunn is the most technical heavyweight in the division right now in terms of IQ and in terms of fighting ability. I think John has to prove himself first. I think there's too many people deserving of a heavyweight title shot to just give it to John Jones because he's John Jones. I think tonight's right. I think it's unfair. Stipe went through the wars, went through the wars with DC, went through them with Nganu. He deserves a chance at retribution. If it's 1-1 and he loses, fair enough. There's no disgrace in that. But you got to give the man his chance as well. He gave DC his shot. He gave Nganu his shot. Why isn't he getting his? Just because he's quiet and he's humble and he's likable and John and John Jones is loud and brash, I don't think it's a fair enough reason for giving John a title shot over him. And like we said, that's not even taken into account Cyril Gan at the moment. He absolutely demolished Derek Lewis, who, although it was an awful, awful fight, did beat Nganu. That is in the history books. So all the signposts point to Cyril Gan way over John Jones. And I think that's something that has to be considered far more than it is. Um, and, you know, I was just thinking about this. I haven't even answered the initial question. Do I think John Jones will fight at heavyweight? Yes, I think he will. If he if he gets rid of this Leon Edwards act where he's holding up a division, yeah. and he hasn't yeah. even fought in the division yet, and he's already holding it up. If he gets rid of that and he becomes more open to fighting and he fights someone in the top five, then absolutely, I think we will see him in the heavyweight division. I who was which of you guys said it was around like uh, nine months or so? Did you both say that? Because I do agree with that as the timeline. I think that is most likely when we'll see John Jones announced. You know, he's bulked up to around two hundred and forty pounds. He wouldn't do that if he wasn't serious. So he won't he won't go through shredding all that weight again. He will fight again. But then, of course, that immediately leads to the title question. And my answer is emphatically, he needs to prove himself first. That I can't really change from because I just think it's so much on that side. 
that it can't really be justified on the other. Yeah, I like that. And I also like that we, we let's not even get into Cyril Gon versus Francis Ngannou because that's a conversation that could go on forever. Yeah. That fight is so insane when you just have the the power and, and everything, just the absolute physical presence of Ngannou. But then, you know, Cyril Gon and everything. And now I'm talking about, but yeah, I agree with you guys. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. Um, I don't know. I think I think Stipe Jones is a fight that I would love to see down the line. Never, I agree with if that. it ever happens. Um, that's why I I honestly I just want to see John Jones in the octagon against these heavyweights because it's so exciting. We don't know what he's going to look like, and we don't know what the heavyweight fighters are going to look like against him. Stipe is such a fascinating fight because how does John handle just one the physical size difference? Because John is putting on a lot of weight now. You never want to judge something based off of training videos, but it doesn't look like he's handling himself as good as he did light heavyweight. And one of the best factors of him at light heavyweight is the fact he's able to move so quick and everything. How does he handle a guy like Stipe, who's very fast heavyweight, amazing takedowns, well-rounded everywhere, could bring the pace to him, does not get tired. I don't know. It's an interesting fight. Overall, moral of the story, hopefully we're praying John Jones soon to the heavyweight division. Uh, we all want to see it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Given the timeline, so I was saying John because I just I was like vouching for him a little bit because yeah. he his point was basically no other champ has to make a case to fight and wait up. Yeah. Why should I? That was basically his point, and I was seeing it through his eyes. But yeah. given the timeline, given the interim belt, and the fights pretty much already made between Gon and Ngannou, I would love to see the Stipe fight, and that winner can take on whoever wins yeah. the championship fight. I think that's it right there, folks. I think Stephen Mujic, John Jones, you answer a lot of questions. You have the goat of light heavyweight against the goat of heavyweight. Whoever wins that has rubber stamped their right to fight for that belt. Uh, if Jones gets through that, feed him to Ngannou, no problem whatsoever. If Stipe wins, he's right back in the mix. I think that's how you solve this whole problem. We've come to a, a collective agreement. <laughs> we, we're, all, we're, all, we're all agreed now. Yeah, absolutely. So... Great podcast tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, please make sure to uh, check out his podcast, The Haymaker MMA Show on YouTube and Spotify everywhere. Um, he's doing great PFL work, so check all of that out. Um, as always, everyone, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. Listen to us everywhere, including iTunes and Spotify. Follow us on Instagram at MMA.Island and check out our great website, MMAIsland.net. And also... Please make sure to click the link in the description to check out our sponsor, BetUS. You can bet there. Place all your bets there. It's the best place to do it. Uh, big shout out to them. Exactly. Um, tonight, thank you so much for coming on. Great podcast, guys. Yep. Thank you for having me. Also, yeah, catch the PFL fights Thursday, August 19th. Kayla Harrison headlines the card. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, amazing, everyone. Thanks for joining us.